The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. I want to start <clears throat> with, uh, this will be part two. Uh, last week we talked, got roots? All right, ladies, I'm not talking about your hairline. All right, I'm talking about root issues on the inside that will actually inhibit you from being all that God wants you to be and doing all that God wants you to do. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, pursue peace with all people. How do you pursue peace with all people? When you forgive, when you release forgiveness unilaterally, that doesn't mean wait till they change. You pursue peace with God and man through forgiveness lifestyle. You walk in the light as He is in the light. You have fellowship one with another. And that blood continually cleanses you from all unrighteousness. It's a continual flow, uh, which is uh, also our current book that's back there. And for those of you watching by Ustream, flowing in the river of God's will. It should be a continuous flow. It should be an artesian flow. It's a river. It can be dammed up by our own flesh and carnality, but also we have the grace of God that when we yield and surrender, that river flows constantly. Remember, you can fool people with your words and you can fool them with your gestures, but you can't hide what emanates. All right? So it's... You're eminent. You're a fragrance of either life or death to somebody, all right? But out of the abundance of the heart, it flows. When the mouth speaks, when there's decrees and declarations, then you add powerful, uh, uh, explicit phrases that, cre that have created power. But the source is what's important. Because... With their lips they praise me, but their heart is far from me. If the heart source is wrong, all the positive words aren't going to accomplish the purpose. But when your heart is right and you get your heart right first, then you decree, you declare, you are literally advancing the kingdom of God and bringing those things which are not as though they were coming to pass. So make sure you start with the right course. But uh, I believe that what God's doing in all of the messages that He's given us over the past year even... Uh, is to prepare a people for an awakening. So I hear messages, just like at the pastor's luncheon, we heard about the honoring the fathers. And I'm saying, okay, uh, but for me to prepare a people is to equip. I want to know how do I do that, right? Yes, it's the right thing to do. We know what's right. But on the other hand, how do I do that? And so that's really what I want to cover today. I want to start with pursue peace with all people and holiness. So you can release forgiveness, walk, which is the love message. Did you know forgiveness, once you release forgiveness, the most profound thing that I saw as a young Christian was that when I released forgiveness, I got peace, but I could also feel that whatever was flowing to that person was love afterwards. Because there's no barrier to the love of God expressing to them. So for me, to preach forgiveness, to preach the remission of sin, it says so in Luke says it in John, go preach the forgiveness of sin. You're preaching the love message of Jesus where the rubber meets the road. It's the, that's the tough love message because it, it, it costs something on your part to walk in that forgiveness and not stay in any kind of an offense. So pursue peace with all people and holiness. You've got to have a pure heart, a clean heart. A pure heart will always win. A pure heart sees God. So we, we need to know how to purify that heart. And without which, no one's going to see the Lord. Without that holiness, no one's going to see the Lord. And looking carefully, lest you fall short of the grace of God. So, this, the grace of God is available. It's just a question of whether or not you're willing to appropriate it or not. You don't want to fall short of the grace of God when it's being made available, lest a bitter root springs up and causes you trouble, and by this many be defiled. Hurt people hurt people. If you can't refrain from talking bad about people, you have the poison. I don't care what they've done. 
Look what they did to Jesus. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That was unilateral. He did not wait for them to repent. He released a flow, a life-giving, loving, forgiving flow that was available to whosoever. Whosoever would receive it. Hosea 10.12 says, They have spoken words, swearing falsely and making a covenant. Thus, judgment springs up like hemlock. That would be poison, right? Judgment springs up like hemlock in the furrows of the field. That's what takes place in the heart with judgments. You make judgments in the furrow of the heart, the soil of the heart. Instead of producing hundredfold return, it's basically choked out by the weeds and the poison that's in there. Now, uh, <clears throat> here, here's what I believe is necessary. So, in light of honoring the fathers, opening and preparing a people, Malachi says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And then later, in Luke's Gospel, we know this was quoted again. And it said, He will go before Him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Who was that? John the Baptist. Didn't he come in the spirit and the power of Elijah? And to turn the hearts of the fathers toward the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared. So basically, if as teachers in the body, it's incumbent upon us to equip of people to make them ready. So that, uh, like one man said, or I, I can't remember, there were several people said the same thing prophetically, that when the glory comes and the power of God comes, there's some that, some that are going to melt and be refurbished and uh, invigorated and empowered and blessed, and others will run from it because they're going to see themselves the way they really are. I'm saying, let's deal with it now to make ready a people prepared for the coming of the Lord. I don't want anybody in my church running from the presence of God because of their guilt and their sinfulness that's in their own heart when we've given you the tools again and again on how to get clean, and not only how to get clean, how to stay clean. So, uh, Luke 1, 17, I will be, he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So this was in advance of Jesus in his earth walk. This was in advance. This was to make, what did John the Baptist do? What did he preach in advance? Repentance. And repentance needs to be preached continually. It's not a one-time deal. Repentance needs to be a yieldedness toward the ability to always remain under lordship. You get out from under it, get back under it. Now, here's the key. Uh, I know there's a lot of teaching on spiritual fathers, but this is the number one truth for everyone in the room, for everyone watching by Ustream. You must be a son unto the father before you're going to be a father unto sons. I've seen a lot of abuse in the name of being a spiritual father in the church. It usually goes to two extremes. One, it either becomes a heavy-handed, authoritarian lordship over people, or it's a irresponsible, careless. I've even seen people that basically could have cared less for the people, but said, oh, I don't want to put a yoke of bondage on anybody. No, but you're also not willing to take responsibility either. So there's, the truth is the tension between two extremes. And I believe that, that God wants us to uh, enter into that, all of us, to mature. But you have to be a son before you're a father. I would say if we want to prepare ourselves for a revelation of the father, we don't need to prepare ourselves to be fathers. We need to prepare ourselves to be sons. Sons and daughters of the Most High God. Whatever that means, whatever brings us into that place of intimacy, that is what is the first and foremost and important thing to be done. So, I'm a son. Jesus gave us that example. And what's interestingly enough, He emphasized sonship. I only do what I see my Father doing. That needs to be inbred into the heart of all believers. I only do what I see my Father doing. I only say what I hear my Father saying. But even more importantly, to me the missing link is not the seeing and the hearing. The whole church prophetically 
evangelistically always talk about the seeing and the hearing. I'm saying, did I not cast out devils? Did I not prophesy? Depart from me, I knew you not. Now, what's missing is the ingredient of genuine intimacy. And that starts with sonship and being a son and a daughter unto God. Intimacy. Intimacy. I don't want Jesus saying to anybody in my church, I know you not. Yeah, you prophesied, you cast out devils, you moved in signs and wonders, but relationally, you weren't a son. And this, this Father God is pursuing us. He loves us more than you know. But at the same time, He doesn't go into the pig pen with you. He waits like He did for me. When I was 19 years old, I had a vision. When I was 19, you don't want to talk about that too much. That's when I, let, I pulled out all the strings. My uh, girlfriend dropped me and I was in the army. And so, man, I'm turning loose. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be as bad as bad can be. And I did a pretty good job of that. But when I got saved, I saw the Lord reaching out to me and crying. And at first, I thought it was because of just my bad behavior. Later, after I got saved, the Lord showed me when He was reaching out to me, and I was basically hurting myself. And that's what sin does to you. It hurts you. Yeah, it hurts other people, but you sin against God and Himself, and yet He would never withdraw His hands from me. A pursuing God. Now, He didn't chase me into the pig pen and command me to come out. But boy, I'll tell you what, He was available the whole time saying, if you will turn, if you will turn to me, I'm already turned to you. I will not withdraw my hands of availability out to you, Dennis. That's when my heart broke and when I received him, was when I saw that as bad as I was, he was still reaching those hands out to me. If you're watching by Ustream, he's reaching his hands out to you right now. He's reaching out to you, and I don't care what you've been or what, where you've gone, what you've done. And, and don't give me this excuse. We did a whole message on excuses. Don't give me this excuse, but you don't understand what I've been through. Well, you tell that to Jesus. See, people try to tell that to me. You don't understand. Dennis and Jennifer don't understand what I've been through. Yeah, but just don't tell that to Jesus. He understands. And don't say he doesn't understand. And I don't have to understand. I'm taking you and delivering you and pointing you to the one that has the ability to do something about it. And his name is Jesus. And he lives inside of you if you're born again. If you're not born again, he can, he can take your pain. He can take your sorrow. But he works from the inside out. You need to invite him in. Let him prove himself. I don't have to prove him to you. He'll prove himself. You invite him. You say, Jesus, if you are who you say you are, come into my heart. Cleanse me of my sin, and I'll live for you and serve you all the days of my life. Because most people are rejecting a God that they've never known who he is in order to effectively reject him. You're rejecting something you don't know. Why not find out if you know him and then decide whether you're going to accept him or reject him. Why don't you get to meet him face to face, spirit to spirit, heart to heart, breath to breath. Make it a real relationship and then decide if you're going to stay there or not. If you're going to keep it or not. Tell you what, he'll prove himself. I'm a son. I do whatever my father wants me to do. And I know that his command is everlasting, John 12, 50. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the father has told me, so I speak. John 5, 19, most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. John 5, 30, I can of myself do nothing. Listen, he that has ears to hear. I can, this is Jesus talking, I can of my own self do nothing. This is surrendered, yielded life. I speak what I have seen with my Father. <laughs> and you do what you've seen with your father. Whoa. John 14, 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me, he does the works. Now, he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the words which you hear are not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Here's what I want to do at this point. I want to address something for church people. And if you're watching by Ustream, you need this because there are levels of hearing, right? Even the parable of the soils talks about 30-fold, 60-fold. It's talking about the condition of the heart and how it receives the word. 
All right. But I want to do it in a little more of a uh, different outline. Communication. It's words. We can all use the same words and we can mean different things by the same words. All right. We talked about you. It all depends what you, you're picturing. Apart from him, you can do nothing. That's talking about in your flesh. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's a different you, isn't it? That's that one, that new creation that's fused together with him, co-laboring. So just the word you, you could get confused on that word. And I say people can get confused on words. How many ever saw my fair lady? Remember Henry Higgins? trained that little girl in school we learned that it was the story was uh, Pygmalion but they made a movie out of it called My Fair Lady and he was teaching her to enunciate her words properly she had a she had a gutter accent you know uh, and finally in her frustration I think there was a relationship beginning to develop and she said words 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 if you love me show me I think God's saying that. You can say all the right words. With their lips they praise me, but their heart is far from me. So your heart can be one place and your words can be, oh, so precious. And what's embarrassing is I hear it all the time. The funny thing is, is uh, it's both, it is a gift and it's a grace now, but at first I didn't care for it. I didn't like having discerning of human spirit because I could feel when the words weren't genuine when the words had yuck on them. I don't care if the words were accurate. You know, the devil uses facts. Look at the facts nailed Jesus to the cross. He said he was a king. Did he say he was a king? Well, that got him put on the cross. But that was the evil in people's hearts interpreting his words. The source of words. There are seven levels of communication. And I want to equip a congregation, uh, believers, who will not be the ones that the Lord would say to you when you say, with your, did I not prophesy? Did I not cast out devils? And he say, depart from me, for I knew you not. That knowing is intimacy. And... Here's the seven levels of communication. And as believers, you could go to the church a long time and stay in the upper levels of communication. Level number one, mere talk. Do you think there's people in the church that really it's just talk? Huh? May not even be saved. It's just talk. They're religious. That's level one. Mere talk. Conversation. Second level of communication. Oh, now it's getting a little deeper. It imparts actual information. You can tell a relationship's growing when someone says hi, and then when someone tells you where they live. They're already giving you information. It's moving to a deep level now. All right? That's level two. Level three. The third level helps other people understand. It gives them practical application. Actually, you could put mentoring under that category. You're actually giving them information that's practical, and there's many ways that it can be practical. Uh, it can be practical externally, and it can be practical as far as an internal relationship. External steps. And you know what? Right now, it must appeal to a lot of people because Facebook always has those articles, and magazines always do that. Seven keys to success, three things to a better life, five secrets to a diet, right? They like that. But that is third level information. It can be helpful. Sometimes just knowing the facts. I can remember when I had open mic in my first church and they would come up and they'd be a little too mysterious. I wanted application, at least third they'd come up and they'd go, for God so loved the world. And then they go sit down. And <laughs> At least give me level three, will you? <laughs> so God, yeah. And how does this apply to you? Give me some understanding. Give me some practical application of what that can mean to me. Uh, 
Actually, mentoring is really doing that. A lot of times it's just uh, the cumulative wisdom, not necessarily even spiritual wisdom. Some mentoring is just the cumulative wisdom of years, right? You learn what to do and what not to do. Kind of a sanctified cumulative wisdom. And then there's wisdom that comes by doing it wrong and then learning how to do it right. Huh? We could save people a lot of aggravation if they really could humble themselves and listen. I've seen people that came for an appointment that I could not help because the entire time they came, they told me how much they knew and had no concept that you just tied my hands. I can't minister to you. You will go home and say, Dennis couldn't do nothing for me. I tried. When in reality, you were unteachable. You already, you kept telling me how much you already knew this. Or you don't, he doesn't understand. Well, as long as you're locked into Dennis doesn't understand and you've done everything right, then why did you even come to me in the first place if you've done everything right? There are people who will open themselves up for that level but never surrender. They like counseling. I don't do counseling. I do the cross. I want to bring the flesh to death and point you to the Jesus in you. That's the best counsel I can give anybody. Go to Jesus. Right? That fourth level, third level is kind of mentoring, the application, giving people some understanding, practical application. But I, I don't want to stop there either. Because then you can start to be a know-it-all. I took a course. I prayed those prayers at the end of the course. I did prayer number one, prayer number two, prayer number three. I've arrived. But the fourth level of communication, this is important. This is, this is part of me likes this part. To either affirm your belief system I, I like a Barnabas spirit, a son of encouragement. I, I believe that when you do something right, I make a big deal about it. If I haven't made a big deal about something in your life, maybe you haven't done anything right yet. But I have a tendency to get really excited. If I was praying with someone and I can feel the spirit and I can feel them go to Jesus, I'll go, there, there, that's it, that's it. Usually I scare them a little bit. There, there, that's it. Whoa, whoa. Because that is union and communion with your Jesus who can do it where no one else can help you. He alone is the answer. That's communicating to confirm their belief system. I trained Jennifer with that basically by discerning of spirits when she would sink into the presence of God the minute I could feel the peace increase I'd say there that's it. That, that, that level of communication is very subjective, but very meaningful. Matter of fact, if someone gets baptized in the Holy Spirit and they speak in tongues, you know, I purposely, as soon as I feel the anointing on them, I say, there, there's an anointing on that prayer language that's very practical to affirm them. I do that purposely. Why? Because I know how the head works. Later on, I go, did I do that or was that the Holy Spirit? Did I make that up? And, and they get into those uh, head games. But if you had someone say, there, that's it, and two witnesses or a dual witness, it is established, it's affirmed. That's an important level of communication. However, you can't affirm something that hasn't been affirmed in you. So that's going to require a deeper relationship with Jesus, right? You can't affirm something that you don't know what they're talking about. All right. The other on level four is also not just to confirm their belief system, but to alter it, to alter their belief system. And one of the best ways is to be who you hang with. If you hang with other hurting people and you're hurting, you're, going, you're not going to see a lot of clarity. You're going to get a lot of sympathy, but you're not going to get a lot of revelation and clarity. I'm sorry. When Jason came to us and we met, the nine of us would meet every Sunday and he sat around, he realized that everyone didn't think the way he thought. That caused him to take his thought processes to the Lord and say, you know what, most of these people aren't thinking the way I'm thinking. 
It had to do with his concept of rescuing or helping somebody. But he needed to see the multitude of healthy people's opinion. Who you hang with is very important. You want to you grow in God, you can't be hanging with people and using it as an excuse, say, I'm ministering to them. If you're more comfortable with the people you're ministering to, that says volumes about you. It's saying you're not really dealing. You can, you can fool yourself and be deceived into thinking, well, I'm not as bad as. Right? Isn't that a deception? Well, I'm not as bad as. I've seen men groups that did that. They got together, but basically, as soon as they saw there were men that were in worse shape than them, they, were, phew, they didn't deal with their stuff. They, they, they rested in the fact that they're not as bad as some of those other guys. All right? Isn't that kind of pharisaical? Thank God I'm not like that person. Oh, yeah. All right. Level four. Do you think these levels are all important? So far, all four. You know, you can't build a relationship with somebody that won't talk at all. And just for the record, quiet people, I can discern your spirit. Not a lot of you quiet people are not humble like Mary before the Lord. Just because you're quiet. Sometimes you've got a motor running in or you're living in low-grade anxiety all the time. You just don't talk much. Or the other people, they, they express it and they look like they're out of control. But you're out of control quietly. All right? Calmness and the lordship of peace is the indication of a spiritual life. Now, level four is to alter or confirm belief. Best way to alter is to offer something better. The fifth is to alter or intensify behavior. To alter or intensify behavior. For us, that, we, we see that engaged mostly in the ministry as restoration. There's a process of restoration, and they basically learn to alter their behavior. They learn how to move away from and move uh, to an answer. It's like there's a light at the end of the tunnel. They might not feel full of joy. They might feel kind of heavy, but there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and you teach them how to move toward that light, that hope does not disappoint. Just because you don't feel like you've got it now doesn't mean it's not going to happen. All right? Hope deferred when you quit and shut down will make you sick. Now, that's the, I wasn't going to spend this much time on these, but I think it's important because I'm really only interested in, in six and seven. I really am for the most part. These other ones are valid, but I'll tell you what, did I not cast out devils? Did I not prophesy, depart from me for I knew you not? It's going to be dependent on level six and level seven of communication. Level six the sixth level of communication is communion. This involves the desire of one person to make himself known to another in order to touch him. You hear that word, touch? We don't talk about that in the church. I talk about it all the time. In order that we might touch him. People go to conferences for a touch. They want an impression. They want an experience. A touch is a place of vulnerability. Do you know how many people I could not minister to who even came for ministry, but they could not be vulnerable. They had excuses for everything. I already know this. I've already dealt with this. I love my mother. <laughs> all right. All the right religious answers. You don't understand what I've been through. That whole... Your hands are tied because it's the Holy Spirit. Grace is for who? Who gets Grace. The humble. As long as they're in that pride and they don't see it, your hands are tied as far as helping anybody. Satan is rooted in pride. God is rooted in humility. Let's go for the root. Now, it's the communion of one person to make himself known to another person in order to touch him and to come into intimate relationship. They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. But that awareness of that touch was actually the baby step of God taking me to the school of the spirit. He said, you close your eyes and you drop down to your spirit and you touch me. You're honoring me. 
I was not hung up on I had to have a vision or a word. I wanted the embrace and the touch, and I wanted to stay there. Then the words and then the visions come. They should be secondary, not primary. Touch intimacy first, then cast out your devils. Then do, right? What was Jesus' complaint? Did I not cast out devils? Did I not prophesy in your name? Depart from me, for I knew you not. We're going to have to reinvent the very foundation of our communication with God. It's not about moving in the gifts. It's going to be about touching, then moving in the gifts. Touch first, move second. Touch first, move second. Failure to touch and move in it, you're basically doing it for yourself. That sixth level is to make someone known to one another and to touch him and come into intimate relationship. The seventh level I learned this from uh, Dr. Fount Schultz. I did, I was just a baby Christian, baby pastor anyway, I was a new pastor, and I was with all these high profile leaders at West Point Military Academy, and I got to do a workshop, and uh, Bob Mumford made a big deal about my workshop, and that made everybody else a little upset who's this young kid's got a workshop, and now everybody's gonna go to his workshop and not our workshop. But Fount Schultz did a, his doctoral thesis on this seventh level. This seventh level of communication is to be an expression. Not just touch, not just build an intimate relationship, but to be an expression. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But what revelation did he need? First, and this is a thus saith the Lord, to make ready a people prepared for what's coming. Yeah, it's going to be a revelation of the Father, but if you don't have a revelation of being a son, don't expect this great revelation to fall all over you. You must be a son unto the Father before you can be a father unto son. And the highest form of communication is to be an expression. Jesus did not walk around saying, I'm a spiritual father, I'm a spiritual father, I'm a spiritual father. We have enough of that. I'm a spiritual father. I even had one person think that I was codependent. I think Dennis needs sons and daughters out of a need. And interestingly enough, the person that said it was codependent. So they saw it through their own glasses. I don't need sons and daughters. I need to put my entire effort on being a son unto the father. And then say, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. That's more important than a title. Right? Be a son. That's the mandate for all of us here to make ready a people for what God's bringing in the days ahead. He who has seen me has seen the Father. He didn't walk around saying, I am a Father, I am the Father. He did say, I and the Father are one. That's relationship. That's union. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There is no greater compliment of an expression to come from the Father. Now, I wasn't going to spend that much time on that, but I want to get into... Uh, what I heard in the, in the pastor's meeting was that we need to honor the fathers, but I'm a how-to person. I right away go, well, let's, 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 how do we do that? And basically in the kingdom, there's basically some simple laws of relationship. Isn't that what we're talking about? Relationship, being a son unto the father. Law number one, we covered this last week a little bit, sowing and reaping. Do you not understand this parable? Jesus is asking them. Do you not understand this parable? If you don't understand this parable, how are you going to understand all of the parables? Sowing and reaping is the ultimate granddaddy of all principles in the kingdom of God. What you sow, you reap. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. What you sow, you reap. You can think you can trick yourself. You can trick other people. You can fool them. But you're really only deceiving yourself because God is not mocked. What you sow, you reap. If you sow harsh words towards other people, you're going to reap a harvest. No, no, you're not just going to reap some harsh words because you sowed some hard words. You're going to reap a harvest, seed time and harvest. That's the way it works. Sowing and reaping. How then will you understand all the parables? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. What you sow, you will reap. They that plow iniquity and sow wickedness will reap the same. It's a law. You don't have to believe in it. 
and it's still going to work. Jennifer took some renegade children, right? The teachers couldn't handle them, and so they gave them to the school psychologist and put them all in one room. There's a little bit of energy in that room. But when she told them that there is a law, that you don't have to believe in it, but it's going to operate whether you like it or not. You don't have to believe in gravity, but you walk off a cliff, you're going to fall down. You can say all the way down, I don't believe in this, I don't believe in this. <laughs> it's going to work. And here it is. This is to make ready a people prepared. I'm serious. This is going to come to the forefront in the days ahead. It has to, because it is the principle, it's a command with a promise. And it says, honor your father and your mother as the Lord God has commanded. This is not a suggestion. As the Lord God has commanded you that your days may be prolonged and that it, meaning your life, may go well with you in the land the Lord your God has given you. Honoring and dishonoring parents. They touched on that, but I didn't hear... The how-tos that are, that are necessary for me to say, to, let's equip these people. How do you honor your mom? What if you had the most horrific childhood imaginable? What if you had the best parents in the world? The point is, you honor them by forgiving them. You don't honor bad behavior. I don't honor bad behavior. I don't honor negligence. I don't honor those things. But those are principles. But if you want to be set free to see clearly, pursue peace with all people, and obviously the root of all roots is really honoring your mother and father. That is preeminent. People have have mother and father. You know, there's people that can talk about Jesus, talk about the Holy Spirit, and to this day you mention the word father and they cringe. I'll tell you what, their relationship with God is very, very, very shallow. That means that you are still seeing earthly fathers is the way you're seeing God. You're still seeing God through a distorted lens. You are not seeing God. You are not relating to God from a biblical foundation. You're, you're coming from your carnal perception. Therefore, it is incumbent to be free to literally recognize to honor your mother and father that things may go well with you. Sowing and reaping, and you don't just reap in kind, you reap a harvest. That is a law, whether you like it or not. Sow the right things, and it's a good law, isn't it? You reap a harvest. You who judge, for in the way you judge, you will be judged by the same standard of measure. Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you will judge. You who judge practice the same things. It's a trap. <laughs> it's a spiritual trap. You live in sin, you reap more sin. <laughs> only, only the work of the cross can get you free. Now, um, I thought it was interesting because uh, Jennifer covered some things, and I believe... Uh, they're accurate, that judgments formed in early life are very powerful. They can be formed even while you're a child. And they shape your root system. Many roots can be just emotional. I've seen this over 40 years of ministering to people. Some roots are just emotional. I would say 80% of them. You get rid of the emotion, you get peace, and you're free. Some of them have strong mental, maybe one out of every 30 uh, emotional dealings has a strong lie attached, a mental stronghold that can be brought down. And many, especially in the sexual area, have demonic hitchhikers that need to be, they, they, you've given place to them and they can hang on. So those roots can be emotional, they can be mental strongholds or lies. And you can try renouncing those lies all you want until you deal with the power behind it. It's not going to work. So I would strongly suggest you start with first things first and quit trying to deal with symptoms, but go for the root level. Go for the root. Doesn't that make more sense? All roots have an entry point. It got started at some point in your life. And demonic activity has permission to harass wherever that, that root of bitterness is. I always felt like 
And that reaping continues until that root is brought to death. But I always felt like, isn't it sad that Christians would put up with unnecessary trials and tribulations? Don't you have enough? In this world there will be tribulation. Jesus said, be of good cheer for I've overcome and have removed its ability. I like the message. I've removed its ability to harm you. But unnecessary trials and tribulations? <laughs> Bitter roots cause that. It says they spring up, they cause you trouble, and actually pushes people to sin against you. Defiles other people. And hurt people hurt people. Now, <clears throat> in understanding these things, when we have wounds or judgments in our heart, our perception, this is the important part, Picture your, your spiritual vision, how we see God, how we see others, and how we see ourselves. And as long as there is bitter root judgment in your heart, and even if you forgot about it, it doesn't matter. We say, well, I, I, don't, I can't think of anybody, but most people use that one up here, the 2,000 thought patterns. The 400 billion in the non-conscious area. That's why David says, search me, O God. And didn't say, I can't think of anything, God. He said, God, you search. There's a big difference between you searching and God searching. You have a way of making excuses for yourself. But, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And no matter what the head learns, if you're a note taker, you should write this down. Because to me, I see this as a crippling problem in the church in general. No matter what the head learns, the heart determines how we see life. No matter what the head learns, the heart determines how we perceive life. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The real, what you really believe in your heart. No matter what the head learns, the heart determines how we see life. And wounds and judgments in our heart. You know, not only that, you know what? You could be holding judgments toward people that was your perception, weren't even accurate. I often watched it like with uh, Jennifer's family, I saw it was really clear. She had, there was Jennifer, the only girl, and two brothers, and all three of them had a totally different perception of dad and mom. That was their perception. And unless they heal their heart, they'll never see God clearly. The one, one, one brother thought mother was the devil. The other brother and Jennifer didn't see what the problem was. The one brother loved the dad's interrogation. And Jennifer ran from those interrogations. <laughs> but ultimately, Jennifer had to deal with the judgment in her heart and the perception whether it was true or not. If it's in the heart, it's your heart. You get, you, somebody get your goat, you've got the goat. I don't care what they've done. Get it out of you. Right? The poison's in you. The perception's in you. Roots are projected onto God and people. Our parents are the primary models for how we see God. Uh, Jennifer mentioned this, uh, ages zero to six. From zero to six, the root system is formed and we perceive authority figures later in life in accordance to that initial perception, zero to six. Makes sense. Ages six to 12, if you looked at us as a tree and roots, then the trunk is developed pretty much between six and 12. Oh, that fun age when everybody seemed like they go momentarily crazy for a while. Uh, preteen. Did you ever see a preteen who wanted to be a teen? <laughs> it could drive you right up a wall, right? But in that age bracket, the trunk of their character solidifies pretty much between ages 6 and 12. And adulthood the roots are often hidden. But push the right button and out will come anything that's not been resolved. Remember we said, how does this happen? Pet peeves? 
the same old, same old. But this perception, until you deal with the root, even demonic activity has permission to harass. That's why I've seen deliverance ministry where the people were set free momentarily and it comes back. I'm saying if we could teach people how to close the door properly, we would see a better successful rate. Quite frankly, I'd rather teach them self-deliverance. You're a believer. Grow up. You know, instead of always looking like birdies who need the mama and the papa to put a worm in your mouth, why don't you go get your own worm? Go dig around in the dirt a little bit and deal with it, right? Now, you can deal with symptoms, but really symptoms need to be dealt with at root level to expedite the process. And reaping does continue until it's dealt with. So, anyway, three levels. How we see God, how we see ourselves, and how we see other people. If there are root issues, they are coming between you and fulfilling your destiny as sons and daughters. You want to prepare for a real outpouring of God's presence and His love of the Father toward you. Then, quite frankly, you're going to start with honoring your mother and father. <laughs> Really. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If your heart is contaminated with judgments against parents, what is it? Honor your mother and father that life goes well? Well, to the contrary, to the degree you don't honor mother and father, things are not going to go well. There's your unnecessary trials and tribulations, and your perceptions are tainted. You really can't see clearly. The heart's not pure. Now, what does it mean to see God? It means to understand God's heart, to have the Father's heart. And who has the Father's heart but the Son? And don't give me how, how dedicated and consecrated you were religiously because we have the illustration of the elder brother. The elder brother did not go into the pig pen. He did not take his inheritance and leave. But he never caught the Father's heart though, did he? He didn't have the Father's heart. Work side by side and never had his heart. You can work side by side with Christians in the church and never get God's heart. You need to be a son and a daughter unto the Father before you're ever going to really understand. And if there's anything in the way, it's the, it's the judgments against Father. And the laws of relationship work like this. Boys, the things you judged your fathers for, you will do the same thing whether you think you can get around it or not. You can vow to do likewise, but that law of sowing and reaping is stronger than your little stubborn determination. I don't care how headstrong you are, it will not override the law of sowing and reaping. You're not that good. You think you can trick your way. People who never resolve parental issues, when their parents were strict, from their perception, we don't know, but from their perception they were strict, they become lenient. But they're going to reap what they sowed. You cannot, doing the opposite doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was, was mean to my grandmother and had all kinds of rejection issues, rejected my dad. My dad said, I'm not going to be like my father. And he treated my mother wonderful. Matter of fact, it was a great example of the way a man should treat a woman. But my dad had the same rejection issues that my grandfather did. You can't trick by doing the opposite. What you sow, be not deceived. You're deceived if you think you can change it in and of yourself. Be not deceived. God's not going to be mocked. What you sow, you reap. It's a spiritual law that overrides your willpower. How you see God, your parents are modeling it. Remember early from zero to six? Basically, they were like God to you, believe it or not. Even as an unsaved person, they were like God. What you saw... If you still picture God in heaven the way your earthly father was, you've got a ways to go into spiritual maturity. As a matter of fact, one of the most healthy signs of a truly transformed life is when your view and relationship with God is nothing like you and your father. And that's even for a good father because a good father is not God. Hmm? Sometimes the people who had good fathers live codependent the rest of their lives rather than developing a relationship with God as their father. How we see God. 
If someone is angry at God, ask them what was their father like? If someone had an angry father and they, they love God and there's no anger toward God, they have, trans, they have a transformed life. They're a son. They're a son unto the father. You've got to quit using mother and father as an excuse. God's given you the cure, and the only cure for excuses is repentance and forgiveness. If you choose not to take those, maybe you like the excuse, but God can't heal an excuse. Here's the second part. How do I see myself? God wants us to see ourselves through His eyes. The Bible says we're new creations being transformed into His likeness, if any man is in Christ. But we can't see who we really are if we're wrapped in layers of barbed wire and self-judgment. One of the most difficult things to teach Christians is to receive forgiveness to themselves. I don't know why. It's almost like they have their own standard. You have a standard better than the cross of Jesus? Good luck. But that's pride and arrogance. Humble at heart. Receive forgiveness. Apart from Him, you can't do nothing. For some people that have pride, and their pride is always in, I'm a failure, I'm a failure. Oh, for crying out loud, you are a failure. Deal with it. <laughs> I don't know what else to do with them. Because they're wallowing in the, I'm a failure, I'm a failure. Oh, get up and do something with your life. You are a failure. And that's not for everybody. But sometimes, what does it take to snap someone out of it and to see themselves that you've got an excuse that you are loved by God and that He's going after you with all of His heart and His soul and His mind, but He can't. It's up to you to turn the heart. The Father's heart is already turned toward us. We're to primarily be sons. Now, how do you see yourself? You have false personalities, bitter roots. Wounds prevent us from seeing who we were created to be. I'll tell you what, just stick with the fact that I'm a son. I don't care about all the other titles. I just want to be a son unto the Father. I worry about the fathers unto sons. But if I'm a son unto the Father and a daughter unto the Father, if you would take that perspective, then you're going to express Him eventually. And if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The goal should be being sons and daughters. You can't skip that and think you're going to be a spiritual father. You'll have a tendency to be authoritarian or you will be, you'll be wimpy, loosey, no discipline. I don't want to say nothing. I want everybody to like me. You know, we don't have parents now. We have, we have grown-up kids who want to be their kid's friend and not be the adult. They need an adult in their life. They don't need a buddy. Big mistake. But our culture's done that. And the last one is how we see others. How can you say, friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log on your own? When someone is hurting, they often take on a victim identity. You will always tell because they're suspicious, critical, analytical. They falsely read wrong motives or offenses when there was none intended. Ever run into that? Do you ever have somebody judge your motives over and over again? That's actually mirroring. You who judge, you do the same thing. Though that's the, Actually, if they were open to ministry, that's what's in their heart. You could bring them a place of redemption if they would humble themselves because the very things they're judging you for is the very thing that's in their heart. You who judge, you do the same thing. It's mirroring. It's embarrassing because they think nobody can discern that. But if you're not offended, you can see it real clearly, what they're doing. It's the blame game. When we see another clearly, we know them by the Spirit, and we have the compassion for their woundedness rather than judging others through the lens of our own pain. Hurt people hurt people. Now, compassion for someone else's pain is still dependent upon whether they will deal with Jesus and their pain. Because the old model that I've seen that never worked and people waste their time with it is they go for counseling and talk bad about the other person. Good luck. 
you're remaining sick as long as you have those judgments in your heart to them. I don't care even if they're all true. The point is, don't you want to be free from the pain and the sorrow and the grief that's in you? Forgiving them doesn't get them off the hook. It gets you, it gets the poison out of you. And you learn to live in difficult circumstances and a lot of times with different people. But you cannot avoid pain. Actually, I want to do a teaching on this someday. We discovered something. Everything that we're teaching, there's a chemical in your body called dopamine. It is probably the most evil chemical in the world. Dopamine, I've seen dopamine operating to where you're addicted to the dopamine more than you are the drugs or the alcohol or whatever you're addicted to. It's the dopamine you want. And there are people that have so much anger in their heart, they're addicted to the dopamine of revenge. They don't want to forgive because they, they are addicted to the, the, the feeling of the dopamine addiction of getting revenge and hurting people. Even if their head tells them this doesn't make sense, it doesn't matter what the head says because in their heart, the bitterness, the bitter root has taken place and demonic activity is helping them and they get a literally even a physical chemical rush that contributes with that spiritual dynamic. So you're, if you have a cigarette habit, it's not even the nicotine that you're addicted to per se, it's the dopamine, it's that feeling that satisfying brings and that's all addiction. Someday we're going to have to just pray. We're going to set everybody free from dopamine. And everybody goes, what? How do you do that? I don't know, but we're going to see it happen, aren't we? Don't you want to get, I, I, I want to see it happen quicker. I want to see addictions go quickly. And if addictions can go, if Jesus does it, it's salvation for many. Many a preacher were alcoholics when they got saved and, and got delivered instantly. I want to see that kind of, that thing. I want to confront that dopamine structure and say there's something in Jesus that brings satisfaction. The opposite of dopamine. The opposite of hype. You want that too? Alright. Now let's make this a prayer. There's five things I want to pray for us right now. Make it your prayer. Personalize this. Because I want to be a son first. I believe I'm a spiritual father. But that's a minor issue. My primary is I want to be a son unto the Father. I'm a son first. I'm a maturing son. I haven't arrived yet. But I want to grow in being surrendered obedience to my Father. Do you want that? And open your heart right now and say, I want to grow in a surrendered obedience to my Father, my Heavenly Father. And if you've got root issues with mom and dad, you people know how to deal with this. Probably only a visitor here and there wouldn't know how to deal with this. You know how to deal with it, don't you? You close your eyes and you see anything about mom or dad, you release forgiveness to them. And if you don't know who your mom or dad was even, you release forgiveness to them. It sets you free. Otherwise, you live with the torment. I am a son first, a maturing son. Everything else about me is less important than that supreme fact. Do you agree with that? Everything's less important than me being a maturing son. Any title, position, or power given to me by man is worth far less. I'm a son first. Secondly, I'm a maturing son and I'm living a lifestyle of broken repentance. That's what pleases my father. Tremble at his word, a contrite heart. I am a maturing son. And ladies, you put daughter in there. I am a maturing son or daughter and I'm living a lifestyle of broken repentance. Because he pays attention to that. You want to honor your father? Do that. Third, I'm a maturing son, and this is very important. I am walking with those that I know have my best interest at heart. That saved Jason. He had to be surrounded by people that had his self-interest. If you surround yourself with peer pressure, you can go down the tubes if those peers do not have your best interest. You should have enough common sense to know who has your best interest and who doesn't.
So that third element is I am a maturing son or daughter, and I'm walking with those that I know have my best interest at heart. We've walked difficult miles together, and they were there for me. They believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. I'll tell you what, I've had a spiritual father that's with the Lord now. But I, I can get choked up just thinking of the attitude he had toward me. It got me through the hard places, knowing that somebody had my best interest at heart. The fourth prayer, I'm a maturing son unto the Father, and I'm going to embrace a lifestyle that maintains humility, compassion, patience. Again, broken repentance as a lifestyle. The fifth prayer, I'm a maturing son. I have no delusions of grandeur nor inflated sense of who I am apart from him. We humble ourselves right now and say, God, we're on the cusp of a great awakening, a great depth of revelation of the weight of the Father God. And the Father's heart is what I seek as a maturing son because the Father's heart will bring sons unto glory. I want to bring the sons unto glory, but I can only be a son first unto the Father. So Father, that's the heart. I don't want to be like the elder brother who did all the good works, labored, did everything right from his own perspective. Those are the people I can't minister to, by the way. The ones that tell me they did everything right. I've seen some tragic situations lately that I could have helped, I saw by discernment what the need was, but they talked themselves out of it by telling me they've done everything right and I don't understand. That just makes me want to cry because it's like, you remind me of how Jesus was to me, reaching his hands out to me, but yet I would not come. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I longed to bring you under, but you would not. You had an excuse and you knew better. It wasn't about me understanding. It's that God understands. Let me point you to the Jesus within who is the answer. But I'm a son. I'm a maturing son. But I've died to the delusions of grandeur and inflated sense of who I am. I am before God. I am his son. First and foremost, in Jesus' name. Seal this, Lord, with these people here, these congregation of sons and daughters unto the Father. Cause them to hunger and thirst for the things that lie ahead. For there is a, a huge tsunami of his presence that's coming to the church. And I don't want anyone running from that presence because of the sin in their lives. Your homework this week is you deal with mother and father issues. And don't, don't give an argument for them. Don't tell me how bad they were. You release loving forgiveness to them. Honoring them is forgiving them. It doesn't mean you honor their bad behavior. It simply means that you won't be doing the same thing. Right, Jennifer? Are those teenage boys? They all ran up to Jennifer. This is that BEH class where they were all too bad for the, for the teacher. And Jennifer taught them about the laws of sowing and reaping, boys, the things you judge your father for. Someday, you're going to do the same thing. And not only that, boys, the things you've judged your mother's for, you're going to reap through a wife someday. It's a law. Too bad. Get rid of the judgments. Because you're the one that gets the bad end of it. Release forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody got their homework assignment? Yes. You're going to forgive mothers and fathers? That's the way we're going to honor God and His presence when He comes. Amen? Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? 
Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the Spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you can take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.